Good afternoon and welcome to this Scranton webinar. This afternoon, this webinar is also being partnered with the uh, State Library of Queensland. Um, we have had several public forums with them in the, in, the, in the flesh. This one is the first we've done with the State Library of Queensland as a webinar. Um, we value that partnership and would like to think that the next time we have one of these, it will again be in the flesh at the State Library um, in, in, in the, on the bank of the Brisbane River. Um, also, I should acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. Everybody uh, on this call, I suspect, is in different areas of Australia and therefore different grouping as the traditional owners, but certainly we should acknowledge the traditional owners and their leaders past, present and emerging. And so to our topic for today, um, you've got a panel this afternoon of, of experts and each of which have been involved in publishing some interesting work. One of the common themes, I think, is a very high note of optimism. And I guess what we'd like to do this afternoon is test some of that optimism um, against some of the reality. I, uh, you only have to pick up any one of a number of books that talk about the state of the climate and you can get very depressed very quickly. Um, and so I was just finding a way through the optimism and the pessimism might be part of the challenge. The common theme that we, is across the pieces of work that each of the uh, panelists have been um, authors of is really about the opportunities and to some extent the challenges that come about from deep decarbonisation, um, a low emissions future, and what are the opportunities and challenges. Um, and there's not many people in the country who are better positioned from their work to be able to talk to these topics. The way we're going to structure this format this afternoon is to spend 20 or 25 minutes exploring a couple of general questions and then um, turn to the audience. And um, hopefully, and I, I've already got, I should say, about 50 questions or 50 odd questions of people who've already submitted questions before this panel, uh, before this panel started. So if we do run out of questions um, that people raise, we've certainly got plenty of material to discuss. I assume most of you, if not all, are familiar with the, uh, the Zoom platform. Um, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. With this number of people, we had well over 800 people register for this webinar. Um, the best the way we, just, we use this uh, facility is to depend upon the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. Um, by clicking in that box, you can see questions that other people have submitted. You may want to support that question. Um, or we may want to add one of your own. And um, we'll certainly attempt to get through some of those. I, my suspicion is that we will struggle to get through all of them. So make sure we have um, plenty of time. Let's get started. Um, there are three panelists. Roscano, who is well known as a, an economist, worked in broad economic policy questions for the country, but also more specifically in climate change. I had the um, great joy and it was, it was great fun working with Ross um, in 2008, which seems was a long time ago, on the first Ghana Climate Change Review, and we've maintained contact. Anna Scarbeck has been the CEO and was the founding CEO of Climate Works in Australia, and I've you know, gone Anna before that, and Guy Dundas, who's worked with me at the Grattan Institute for a couple of years, has also a very deep background in climate policy in this country, and was the co-author with me of a recent report. So. That just illustrates that all of us have had um, some history in the climate wars. And, you know, we've got a strange situation where we see, saw last week, I think it was, Albo wrote an email to SCOMO talking about um, whether there should be some sort of truce in the climate war. And I think the simple um, way of summarizing that was the offer of truce was rejected. Um, what that might mean next that remains to be seen. But I guess for me that raises the question, um, and I want to just take it to each of the three of you. We've, pictures have been painted of, of what needs to be done, what can be done, and there's not much doubt in the in the published work of all three of the panelists that there are you know this is this is an achievable challenge. Um, but I wonder now, as you look at where we are in, with COVID, and as you look at the the state of the climate war. How do you think we are looking in terms of making progress against this, this challenge? Um, so Ross, why don't we start with you and then Anna and then Guy, and your, your reflections of your degree of optimism or pessimism about grappling with this challenge, given the nature of the work you published recently, which says 
basically not only is it doable, but there's significant opportunities for Australia. Ross. Yes, I'm very optimistic about uh, uh, the prospects for Australia if we embrace the opportunity. Uh, I'm not uh, optimistic that we will embrace the opportunity. They're two quite different questions. Uh, how does COVID affect things? Uh, I think that uh, we need a continuation of a strong stimulus to demand in the economy. And uh, uh, the, the more that that can be placed on investment, uh, that yields um, uh, long-term uh, uh, useful output, uh, the better off we'll be in the long term, uh, and uh, the best candidates for uh, large levels of uh, uh, business investment uh, are building the lower the low emissions economy of the future, uh, looking further ahead uh, through to growth through the 20s, and we're going to have a tough time uh, in the in the next 10 years economically in Australia. We had a had a tough time in the last seven years. I call them the dog days. So we were just about the worst performer in the whole of the OECD, worse than Japan in output per head and productivity growth. And uh, unless we uh, substantially change our trajectory, we'll do worse in the next 10 years than we did in the dog days. And the dog days were miserable. Uh, and uh, uh, I see uh, no better uh, focus for uh, large scale investment to build uh, incomes growth for the future uh, than uh, an acceleration of the transformation to the, the, the low emissions economy. So uh, COVID actually strengthens the case for building the superpower, brings forward the, uh, uh, the, the, the timing that uh, is best for the Australian economy. Uh, will uh, Australian leaders embrace that and give Australia a chance of coming strongly out of recession and then having a prosperous future? Or will, will we vote for a worse version of the dog days we had in the last seven years? Uh, well, that will be played out in the next uh, year. And uh, hopefully we can all have a little bit of influence on the outcome. Tony, you're on mute. My apologies, it's the normal error. Um, not many organisations have done as much as Climate Works in thinking about what a decarbonisation future could look like. Um, you've written two major reports, you know, Pathways to Deep Decarbonisation, which I think was published in about 2014, and more recently, Decarbonisation Futures. And in particular, that one talks about how there's strong action is necessary across um, all levels of government, business and individuals. If someone says this has to happen, is it likely to happen? And what, you know, what, how do you feel about that? Um, uh, is this report falling on deaf ears or is, the fer is it fertile ground? I'm not sure which of those analogies you prefer. <clears throat> um, so, uh, Tony, you've brought us here because we're experts in decarbonisation and uh, by asking crystal ball questions about what will happen, of course, goes beyond anyone's expertise. So with that caveat, um, <clears throat> uh, I think the, the link to your previous question around how might Australia move forward, I'll start there in particular and reference the technology investment roadmap, which was indeed the uh, uh, national policy that was the subject of the letter that Anthony Albanese wrote that you mentioned. And uh, that uh, technology roadmap outlines uh, the range of technologies that our research also um, outlines, uh, they're very consistent. And, and you're right that it, it's well understood, but, but that, that document um, uh, covers the major groups of technologies that our research uh, highlights are necessary um, and available for uh, reducing Australia's emissions to net zero. We look across the sectors of buildings, industry, transport, electricity and agriculture, and it's important um, as our, doc, our research finds, but also that document acknowledged that the story is broader than electricity. Even though the political debate has been there, um, the technologies span all of those sectors and uh, the, um, the government's technology investment roadmap discussion paper highlighted that. And it also highlighted another key finding of ours, which is that many of those technologies are already available, but not yet widely deployed. And particularly for the built environment, where there are, and in industry where there are energy savings, um, the challenge has been in, in accelerating deployment. 
So there is, in fact, quite a lot to work with in the technology investment roadmap process. Um, and uh, the letter that you mentioned um, that the opposition wrote to say that they could work with that, uh, I think is a very positive sign. And indeed, there is yet more work to be done after identifying the technologies. What they need, of course, is support in the nature of the funding institutions that we have in ARENA and CFC, but also in policy signals for creating demand for these technologies. Um, so there is quite a lot more work to do, but there's a really good platform on which to do it. Uh, <clears throat> and you've acknowledged uh, our, our research shows, as does Ross's, that Australia can have a really thriving economy uh, in a net zero emissions global economy. Um, I think it is a bigger discussion, the global discussion and the impact of COVID. And, and for me, it, that has intensified both my optimism and pessimism fears. COVID makes the moment of opportunity much more, potentially much more likely to be achieved because what our research showed is the technologies is there, we just have to um, accelerate investment and capital investment is, is, a, is a core function in, in stimulus packages. So there's a great alignment and we know the evidence shows um, very good jobs creation potential and a lot of this is infrastructure and interest rates are low at the moment. So there's actually a great number of factors uh, suggesting that this moment for reset is, a, is, a, is, is that moment to align economies with decarbonisation. But at the same time, it's a massive moment of major distraction for decision makers. And some of what has slowed us down in the past, you've referred to the politics, that's true. But a lot of what slows us down is also human inertia. That everyone who runs a business or runs a government already had a day job before climate change came along. And so adding attention span and mental effort to the task um, requires consistent focus. And so the school kids marching in the street and the politics have helped provide that focus, but now COVID takes that focus away. And, and for me, those two um, factors are, are the intensification of what COVID does for, uh, for, for my hope around climate action. Yeah, look, I think that's an interesting thing that Grattan picked up in a separate report we published earlier this week, Anna, that now's a time when we've got to focus on the on the urgent and some things will get pushed back, but many people have already written about, well, climate change is there waiting for us. Um, Guy, you know, it's interesting to watch some of those, this emerge, right? You, you worked inside the government um, at the time when Ross was trying to convince the government about certain things, but then more recently in this work, Start With Steel, stepped out of the normal energy electricity side of things and taking a perspective on something which is in one of those sectors that you know, Ross has had a look at in his book, Superpower, and, and Climate Works is considered as well. Looking at that, the, the, the start with steel, the opportunity there, does, do you end up feeling that there is a way out of this or does this make, oh my God, this is just too hard? How, how, how does that make, what's your feeling about this in terms of just, you look at, you've done all the analysis, where does that leave you in terms of, what does this now look like? Yeah, look, uh, it's certainly, um, if you pick up the daily paper and, and read about the politics of it, it is easy to get caught up in a, in a pessimistic mindset. But, but on balance, I, I am optimistic and, and, and Start With Steel reflects that and, and, and the work that we did there built on that of Ross and others and, and, and did have that optimistic tone. And, and really where that comes from is from the opportunity that technology and economics present us. And, and that, that opportunity is largely independent of politics and policy. Now, of course, policy should get on board and support those technological trends so that we can capture the opportunities fully. But that opportunity is clear and getting clearer every year. And, and really that does come from um, reductions in the cost of, of wind and solar in particular. Now, obviously the story is broader than electricity as Anna mentioned, but electricity is a, is a very important sector and wind and solar gives us the opportunity to reduce emissions at scale and then move on and electrify with low emissions other sectors such as transport, um, industrial and building heat and other sectors and really spread that decarbonisation through the economy. Now, um, I think you know, we are in a world where for those who do do this as a day job, 
it's become really clear that those technological trends have really strengthened over the last maybe three years. But I think the public debate hasn't quite caught up. Um, my sense is that those trends are so strong that it will become a broader awareness within the public debate. And that will in turn start to influence policy in a more positive direction. So um, when I bring all those things together, I, I'm definitely optimistic on, on a time scale of decades. I'm always nervous about what could happen in the, in the, in the rough and tumble of politics in the short term. But I think those technological trends will take us in the right direction. And, and um, Start With Steel was just one example of that, where we saw a way of, of using Australia's wind and solar resources to make low emission steel, which just wasn't something that would have been talked about um, in any way the same way, even only two or three years ago. And Tony, our latest report also found that evidence about the change in the last five years. And we spent a bit of time comparing our net zero emissions pathways in the 2020 report with the 2014 report. And it confirms exactly what Guy was saying, and not just in electricity, although the electricity price reductions have been stunning in that time. It confirms that even our own best available evidence from five years ago, which was considered optimistic then, was outperformed by the technologies in nearly all the sectors. Um, and so, uh, for example, going beyond electricity, thinking about transport, electric vehicles, it's obviously a global market, not just in Australia, but our data five years ago suggested that on economic tipping points, the Australian fleet might be maybe a third electric vehicles by 2050. And in this, uh, this year's report, it's about a third two decades earlier in 2030. So uh, again, that depends on policy signals and the like, but the technological ability and the price tipping points were able to be reached two, two decades sooner. And we saw uh, other shifts. Electric aviation, I remember Ross, you commenting, it wasn't on the radar when the first Gano review was done. And it wasn't in our report five years ago, but it is now. Uh, there are venture capital firms investing in electric flight today. And, um, so there are technologies arriving on the scene, but also the performance of the core technologies in electricity and transport and in industry um, are continuing to improve faster um, than the data showed. And that's, of course, because deployment is correlated with cost improvement and no um, literature review can predict what the deployment will be around the world. Um, but we have found that the opportunity there is not just that it's more attractive to act, but that the residual harder to abate emissions that they're always sort of left over that we, we haven't got a substitute for and therefore we need carbon forestry and natural solutions. That has also been shrinking over time in our reports. And it's indeed more than halved in the last five years of, of what's the residual unabated emissions in Australia that we would rely on natural solutions. So that's also a, a cause for optimism around technological improvement, provided we deploy it. <laughs> and Ross, you've been, um, you know, with good reason, quite critical of the role of business, particularly big business, in uh, in this whole process over the, the, the last decade or more. And I'm wondering whether or not what we've just been talking about, from you know, what Guy and, and Anna have commented on in relation to technology, and you know, in our discussions with a number of businesses, they are now looking to embrace some of this stuff faster than governments. So. How do you see the role of business? And, and you've been, you know, yourself well, quite recently involved in trying to help be part of the process of decarbonisation in some key sectors. How do you see the role of business and the role of government now? Is it, is it, is it changed or is this just a smokescreen, do you think? Uh, first of all, uh, I'm more critical of uh, uh, government to forgive, giving in to pressure from business. Uh, the political culture of Australia has deteriorated in a way that weakens democracy, weakens the prospects of prosperity and good government in the last generation here as it has in America, Britain, but not as badly as uh, America and Britain, but it's been serious here. Uh, there was a time when uh, government was better at taking a decision in the public interest and leading business rather than being led by business, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, discussions of climate are 
probably been amongst the worst examples of what is really a corruption of the policy making process, uh, business having disproportionate influence uh, uh, and um, the public interest not getting a look in. Uh, so, uh, I, sure, I'm uh, critical of business in that, but I'm critical of what's happened to our political culture to let that happen. Uh, I remember a conversation with Malcolm Fraser a few uh, a few uh, years, oh, no, a few weeks before he died. Um, uh, we were, he'd just read my book, Dog Days, and uh, he rang me up and said he'd like a yarn about a few things in it. And, uh, and so uh, he wanted to talk about how uh, government had just caved into pressure on things like the mining tax, the, uh, uh, the, the climate policy. Uh, he said, uh, back, uh, back in 76, I put a 100% marginal, marginal tax on uh, the increase in oil prices. And uh, I rang up the bosses of BHP and uh, Exxon and they, they said, oh, that's a pretty rotten thing to do. Uh, but it, it didn't occur to them to run a public campaign to uh, defeat what, a decision the government had taken in the, in the public interest. So we implemented it. So that's just an example of how much Australian uh, uh, political culture has changed. And uh, if vested interests dominate policy, you don't get good uh, policy in the public interest. And if we let our democracy deteriorate in that way, we won't get prosperity, we'll have economic problems, we'll have climate problems, problems of all other kinds. It's up to us in a democratic polity to make sure that our government governs in the, in the, uh, the public interest. That said, uh, there has been a change in, um, in, uh, uh, the, in the way business is handling this issue, driven by partly by consumer attitudes, partly by investor attitudes, partly by the spread of knowledge. Um, I think it's been led in, uh, uh, well, it's been led outside the English speaking world. The English speaking world uh, has a more distorted view of uh, our climate and uh, the, the necessary transitions we have to make because of the dominance in the media in these countries, Australia, uh, US, uh, of uh, particularly powerful and distorted uh, uh, media interests. But uh, uh, you, you don't have that distortion of knowledge in Europe or Japan uh, or uh, in Korea. And, uh, and so uh, we're getting a fair bit of leadership and that's quite uh, from uh, those other developed countries. And that's quite important in business. Countries like BP, uh, Shell, countries operating in Europe know that they have to... Uh, um, uh, deliver on uh, a low carbon future, deliver on zero emissions before 2050, or they don't have a future. And they operate globally, and that, that starts to have an influence globally. And uh, uh, Australia's big mining companies, BHP and uh, Rio Tinto, both dual listed companies with one of their listings in, in Europe, but in London. Uh, so uh, that, they're influenced by those things as well. And so we are getting some positive influences, uh, mainly from those parts of the world where discussions of what should be scientific issues uh, are being distorted by ideological perspectives from a particular part of uh, uh, the, the media community. But uh, 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 so uh, uh, the, the, the business approach uh, uh, has changed uh, largely for those reasons, I think. The influence of, of uh, um, of non-American, non-Australian multinationals uh, uh, on our uh, um, on our business uh, uh, perspectives. Now, when you get very large opportunities uh, to uh, make money out of doing things in a different way, uh, it is often the case that established business finds it very hard to do it. Um, although established business uh, is in the best position to do it, uh, but it wasn't IBM. Uh, that, uh, that that turned the, uh, uh, the the desktop computer into something that everyone's got on their desk. Uh, it, it was a few kids in a garage in in California. Uh, it, it it wasn't uh, uh, Kodak who dominated the global market in in uh, uh, photography that introduced uh, new kinds of photography using uh, information technology. Again, it was a few kids in a different garage uh, in Boston and. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, this is a very 
common feature of innovation that major research programs in the Harvard Business School have have uh, led to, to publications explaining why it's the case. But it's usually new firms that lead innovation. It's just very hard for established firms uh, to break the models that, that have made them successful. Just, just as it was very, very hard for the world's most successful polity and economy, uh, Imperial China, to adjust to the Industrial Revolution. It, it, it had been for a long time the most successful, best system in the world. I couldn't see why it had to change. And so it was uh, China, Chinese uh, influence, power, uh, sovereignty was destroyed because it couldn't adapt to all of that change from all these fleet-footed barbarians uh, doing things in a different way. Uh, well, the same happened in, uh, uh, to computers. Uh, the same happened to photography. Um, the same will probably be true happening in uh, a lot of the new technologies. It's very hard for uh, established players to, uh, uh, to, to lead in innovation because, uh, because they've been so successful in doing things in a different way. Now, those who are able to change quickly have many advantages. They've got the markets, they've got the balance sheet. Uh, so it'd be very interesting to see, for example, how Shell and BP who are now committed to to becoming zero emissions economy, economies, great oil companies becoming uh, zero emissions companies. It would be very interesting to see if they succeed in doing what IBM and Kodak uh, weren't able to do. Yeah, look at Ross, I think that, that opens up to me, there's, and there's some questions that have been coming in around this as to, well, given we've got that perspective of business for business reasons, we've got the technology developments that both Anna and Guy have commented on as well, where does that mean we might go in terms of the dependence on key policy so you know we've all of us have been involved in various ways in thinking about well carbon pricing targets um, mechanisms to reduce emissions and i think australia almost certainly holds the world record at having tried and abandoned more um, emissions reduction policies than just about anybody else but do we need that and if so what does it look need to look like i mean we've got the, the federal government as anna said which is got a combination of a very, I guess a very vague, but long-term target of emissions reduction to net zero sometime in the second half of the century. But the technology roadmap might very well be, unless you're starting with a map, even if we haven't got a vehicle to get there yet. Um, and Guy, you've been talking, you've been involved yourself deeply on the, in, in terms of trying to make some of these carbon pricing mechanisms work. Is it likely that we're gonna just continue in a mushy way with, sector-based initiatives that might fit together but might not but will stumble forward for a bit and we'll have you know probably the in some ways the worst of what ross is talking about before we might find our way back to the best or it's interested in how do we the, the, the role of government policy is it is it necessary and if so what would be the minimum we need and what's the minimum we might expect Guy, do you want to start with that yeah look i think Unfortunately, from where we are now, we are in a second or third or fourth best world where we are really, um, we're not going to be using carbon pricing in the foreseeable future, I think, as the key policy mechanism. The, the politics of it in Australia are just too toxic. Um, maybe one day things will be different and we'll return there, but I think we are looking at a, a much more varied um, bunch of policy tools and, and, and focusing on specific sectors. I guess bringing together your comments about policy and, and some of Ross's comments about technology and, and innovation and disruption, I think the prospects for um, really a, a technology-led um, emissions reduction are quite good in some sectors, and, and we're seeing that in electricity, and, and, and that will continue potentially with the support of, of um, electricity users that are actively and proactively moving towards lower emission sources. Um, the prospects of that in, in road transport, if electric vehicles um, reducing costs at a, at a rate as fast as some are expecting, then you could see a, really a, a zero or negative cost shift to a lower emissions form of, of road transport, and that could happen quite autonomously. But we are left with those hard to abate sectors where really policy is crucial, and, and, and steel is one of those, but other ones are aviation, long distance shipping, um, agriculture, petrochemicals. And really, you are looking at, at, at um, a very important role for policy there. And if we do have to go down the path where perhaps um, where, so Europe obviously has a carbon pricing scheme at the moment, 
but they're looking at additional policies involving mandates on, for example, low emissions aviation fuel as a way of, um, in a sense, bolstering that policy support in those sectors where it is extre you know, particularly hard to reduce emissions. Um, we don't have that broad-based carbon pricing, but, but we should be looking at those sorts of policy mechanisms to move to cleaner forms of steel, cleaner forms of cement, uh, cleaner aviation fuels, start thinking about reducing emissions in or offsetting emissions in ag agriculture. So I think there is a role for um, really a, a, a very miscellaneous bunch of policies to start um, to keep things moving in those sectors and, and not just leave it to the 2040s. Now, you said quite a bit about the, the, the need for governments uh, at, number, at all levels to really drive this. But do you see that? How do you see that nexus between government, the need for government to do things versus or what mechanisms do they use to actually do that, given the sort of the history of what we've seen? And, you know, you've lived through many, much of that history yourself. Yes, there are three parts to the re response to your question, really, which, which we often get asked, well, if there is this great improvement in technology, does, does government policy, do we need it at all? Um, and the first response to that is yes, because of the race against time due to the climate science. So if we weren't already uh, on a path to breaching the two degrees warming limit and on a track to three, then I would be far more relaxed that ultimately, over the course of this century, consumer sentiment and the, the, the rise of the next generation of voters and consumers and leaders, combined with the positive direction of technology progress that we see, would get us there. But it will take too long at that natural generational pace for where we're at on the climate science now. We have emitted too much since the Industrial Revolution, so that we find ourselves at 2020 with three decades left to eliminate emissions from the economy if we go at full pelt, if, so that if it looks like quite a sharp sort of triangle and we halve emissions in this decade worldwide is the path that the IPCC has identified is what's needed if we are to avoid two degrees warming, which beyond which is ecosystem collapse or coral reefs and, and much more. We know all about the extreme weather and drought and bushfire intensity that that would bring. So that's the that reason number one why policy is needed is the acceleration. And, and we have a shared interest. We all, there's a, pub, a strong public purpose in avoiding that, co that co collapse that comes beyond those temperatures. Reason number two is the sector specific response that Guy talked about. So even a decade ago when Australia was in the throes of um, creating its own economy-wide carbon pricing scheme, our research showed then that a carbon price is necessary but not sufficient. So that even with a broad-based carbon price, sector, sectors such as built, the built environment and energy efficiency needed a different type. Their barrier was a split incentive problem rather than a price signal. Now we find ourselves a decade on, that is still the case, that the infrastructure transition does look different in different sectors and the, the balance between price signal and other measures uh, can be and should be tailored to those sectors. And we find ourselves also at a moment 10 years on where there's in fact a more positive outlook around industry development for, for future competitive advantage and growth. So it's not just the moral duty to abate for the sake of all ourselves and our, our future generations, but also there is an, an opportunity to build new industries. So leaning into that has always taken government policy. It's how, it's how government built the energy sector in the first place uh, and supported new industries to come and so on. Indeed, uh, different governments have taken a different view on that, but, but essentially there's an industry development opportunity now to bring forward some of these technologies, um, which we hope uh, adds to the scientific imperative to go faster. And the third reason for why a government policy is needed is that not only are sector specific policies uh, needed, but the, the broad brace still is as well. And, and that goes back to the scientific reason, the, the only way we avoid global warming continuing, like the only way we actually stop the temperature increase is to stop emissions being out of balance. We've got to get it to zero. And that includes every single ton. So that means every sector, and it means that the, the, the economy-wide 
price signal or an alternative form. You could cap emissions, you can regulate. There are, there are a variety of ways to achieve the same outcome. But if there is not a requirement to eliminate the emission alongside support to do it in time, then we won't stop global warming. And Ross, you've, um, you've talked about this a lot, this issue of the choices governments have um, in terms of avoiding the, going back to the dog days. So how, how do you, and, and so ScoMo rings you up and says, listen, mate, um, what do you think I should do next? I'll put that, uh, I'll say, listen to what uh, Anna's just said and then listen to what I'm about to say. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, really expanding on what Anna said, uh, 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 I'd, I'd, I'd identify three areas where uh, uh, what governments do matters, even though the uh, technological developments have been highly favourable, much more favourable than, than I anticipated, especially for electricity. But electricity is really important because electricity go governs the cost of the transition in transport, very important in the transition in industry. So, uh, uh, but, but it's not only there, and we, we our guy mentioned, uh, 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 transport, uh, electrification, and, uh, uh, and both Guy and Anna have referred to industry. But uh, firstly, there, uh, the, the, uh, the carbon, the failure to tax the damage that emitters do to the rest of society is not the only externality here. One very important one is there's a big externality in innovation. There's a big disincentive for first movers uh, in any industry. The, the first mover makes mistakes, always has. Uh, uh, te Tesla invented most of the uh, clever new things for the electricity system, but uh, he, he didn't make any money out of it because he, he started to do it and everyone looked over his shoulder and uh, saw they could do it slightly better and, uh, uh, or, or, or not, not quite as good, but were faster at it. Um, so uh, uh, you do need incentives for innovation. Uh, to, and especially to carry part of the capital cost of the pioneering efforts. The people who try new things, make, make mistakes, everyone learns from them. That's been ARENA's role. It's been a very good role and it should go on to uh, providing similar support for innovation in industries using renewable energy like, like zero emissions uh, still making. Secondly, uh, every industry has a lot of regulation around it, and that regulation can be helpful or damaging to uh, uh, economic performance or innovation. Uh, what we've put around the electricity sector in Australia is world class in terms of uh, uh, adding to costs and, uh, uh, and inflexibility, the transmission system that, that just can't del deliver except at enormous cost uh, on uh, 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 delivering uh, uh, power from the low cost uh, uh, renewable energy system. So you've got to get the regulation right. That's an essential role for government. And if government, government doesn't care about whether these new zero emissions uh, uh, sources of activity develop, then it won't give the priority to sorting out that, uh, uh, that, that uh, regulation. Um, and then there's the, the hard to emit uh, sectors that uh, Anna referred to. There, there are going to be some areas where uh, technological improvement leaves very high costs and civil aviation has been mentioned. Uh, I'm very confident now that we will handle uh, short distance civil aviation, Sydney to Melbourne, um, uh, uh, Horsham to, uh, to Dubbo uh, uh, with um, better design planes that are more efficient, more aer aerodynamically efficient and uh, 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 electric engines um, probably batteries, but the really long distance uh, batteries and hydrogen uh, cells are just very heavy uh, and uh, you're not going to fly non-stop from uh, uh, Melbourne to London uh, or even Melbourne to New Delhi. Uh, uh, and so you, you're going to need uh, uh, other technologies. We do have zero emissions biofuels, but they will be more expensive, at least for some time. And, uh, and so you do have to do, put something in place for the hard to, for, the high cost emission sectors and sometimes the high cost emission sectors will be it'll be cheaper to um to offset uh, rather than to uh, uh to reduce emissions directly uh, but uh, no one's going to invest in offsetting unless there's some incentive to do it you actually need a policy to make it happen it's it's the height of I'm actually a supporter of uh, research uh, development and commercialization of uh, geological sequestration. Uh, I don't think it's a 
it's a uh, magic silver bullet that will answer all problems, but in some circumstances it will be useful. We don't know how useful it will be because we haven't put the research, development and commercialization investment in uh, to find out. We should find out. Uh, but even once you've brought down the costs of uh, geological sequestration as low as they can go, it will never be cheaper uh, to, uh, to use that rather than just to vent uh, your blast furnace emissions into the, into the air, just as it will never be cheaper for a Collingwood paint factory uh, to, to uh, uh, pick up all its mess and, and cart it out to a safe dump uh, on the edge of Melbourne and dump it in the Yarra River and given a free choice business for 100 years, dumped it in the Yarra River and made, made the Yarra River uh, not only uh, uh, unsafe for fish and, and humans, but impossible to live along the, the banks uh, for, for a lot of it. Well, that well, we put in place the regulation. It costs business something. It's never going to be cheaper uh, to put in place sequestration uh, 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 arrangements than to simply uh, uh, pollute freely. Uh, and so you need policy for that. And the third area is linking to international regimes. Now, this is going to be crucial in the period ahead. Europe's in a really interesting space, despite... Uh, uh, the, the fragmentation of uh, politics uh, uh, in Europe, uh, despite uh, Britain's leaving, both Britain and the rest of the European Union were more strongly committed than ever to uh, 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 rapid decarbonisation. Uh, and uh, uh, Europe's in the process of coming up with uh, stronger policies uh, on decarbonisation, and they will include border taxes. Uh, let's not kid ourselves. So, uh, we're, uh, through the Australian-German uh, uh, Climate and Energy Transition Hub uh, at the University of Melbourne and, and, and uh, ANU, had a lot of contact. We had uh, when the when the institution uh, was alive uh, with uh, German, uh, big German uh, uh, companies and German government. It was just accepted amongst German steelmakers that if they were going to be around in the 2030s, they had to be zero emissions, and so. Their mind was on how can we do that? Well, maybe the cheapest way is to, is to get uh, iron metal made from hydrogen from renewable energy from Australia. Uh, at least we'll keep the rest of our business uh, competitive. Uh, and our real business is in doing all the clever uh, uh, value adding uh, after you make the iron metal, turning it into a Mercedes Benz, all the steps uh, uh, along the path there. Uh, so Europe is, is, is going to uh, move more strongly in this direction. And anyone trading with Europe or wanting a free trade agreement with Europe is going to have to have domestic policies, including targets, that the Europeans think is a reasonable uh, uh, commitment to the international effort. Now, the US is very interesting. Under Trump, uh, uh, official America at the, at the federal level uh, has been uh, seeking to undermine the Paris Agreement. But it, it's more likely than not, nothing certain in this political world in, a, in an era of uh, pandemics, but uh, it's more likely than not uh, that uh, uh, in November we'll see elected uh, uh, a, a Democrat president more strongly committed than Clinton and Gore or Obama and Biden uh, to uh, uh, strong climate policies. Uh, and it's very likely that we'll have uh, Democrat majorities in, in both houses, a, a, a situation that hasn't existed since the first term of um, Obama. Uh, and the first item on their agenda is, uh, um, if we're going to do all this, uh, we're, we're going to have border taxes on people who aren't playing the game. And so making sure your policies are acceptable to other players is going to be very important. We might say, well, our main trading partner is China, uh, three times important as Europe plus America together. But China is going to adjust to what it, what it has to do to get into uh, uh, the American and European markets. And if the Americans are saying, we won't take any uh, metal manufacturers if they're made from high carbon steel, uh, then, uh, then, then China, for its own climate reasons, and then for these trade reasons as well, we'll be insisting that um, if we're part of uh, 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 a global uh, uh, um, supply chain involving steel, uh, that we're, we're zero carbon too. We're going, we'll take that as a comment or a forecast, right, in terms of the political outcome in the United States. But I think um, 
Um, well, I, no, I, I said more likely than not. I, very wise. <laughs> very wise. Um, I think there's a, we're getting sort of uh, towards the last 10 minutes or so. Um, there's been a number of questions in two areas. One is around people are obviously fascinated by the technologies and a number of the pieces of work that you've all been part of recently have talked about the role of technology and we've discussed that a little. The ones that seem to get certainly been the feature of some of the questions we've had are hydrogen, CCS and nuclear. Um, we haven't talked, we've, Ross, you mentioned a sequestration um, and there's been a little, we talked a little bit about the role of hydrogen in different ways, but not so much nuclear. And then the other area, which is not so much technology as well, what about agriculture and food and land, um, which seem to still be quite hard, maybe opportunities. So I don't, rather than sort of take it, go out, just pick one of those and maybe your thoughts about either, what do you find is the technology side of that that's most interesting or challenging? And if you do have any comments about the, um, it's a whole land sector, which is you know significant in terms of its uh, both its emissions and possibly its um its its opportunities as well. Sure, well, that's quite a, <clears throat> quite a smorgasbord of technologies. It's hard to choose one, Tony. But um, I'll sort of jump in on um on, on CCS. I mean, I think it's become very clear to me, and and I think most people in the sector would agree that over the last decade, the the reduction in the cost of renewables and the the lack of progress in CCS just means that it's it's, it's never going to be a widespread usage in the power sector. So time has just passed it by. But I think Ross alluded to this. Um, there may still be a role for CCS, and I, I think it's much more likely to be in industrial sectors where you have a, a chemical process or an industrial pr process that produces a relatively pure stream of CO2, and therefore the cost of capture is very low. Um, once you um, have that captured, then I think we understand the geology of storage reasonably well, and it becomes a question of, of whether you have the favorable geology. So I think there, there is definitely a role for CCS to play, but it's not in the power sector. And so it is quite a niche role. So, you know, I wouldn't sit here and rule it out, but I also wouldn't make it the centerpiece of any, any technology or policy um, strategy. You know, it, it's, probably, it's, not the, it's not the knight in shining armor that perhaps um, some people were thinking it was a, a decade ago. And then I guess in terms of the land sector, I mean, I mean, you've, you've sort of set out the broad contours really well, um, both a challenge and an opportunity. I think that the opportunity is much clearer. So I'll start there. I mean, there will be places where it's harder and more expensive to reduce emissions than to offset it through the land sector. Um, and so scaling up our capability and understanding the science and really working out what it it takes to offset emissions at large scale um, is really important and, and Australia has the land and, and the, the soils um, to do that at, at a large scale and, and potentially offer that to people internationally. So that is a big opportunity. Um, in terms of agriculture, I mean, um, you know, there's a, there's a genuine question about whether, um, you know, it'll be a combination of, I guess, moderating demand and offsetting or whether there will be genuine scalable breakthroughs in terms of how we you know what we feed cattle and therefore what they what they belch and, and what goes into the atmosphere and and to be honest that's a bit beyond my my area of expertise so i'll sort of leave it there but i think certainly um you know there will be places where we just have to use offsets to to, to mop up those last residual emissions that are really hard to get rid of yeah i get the um i mean when i've looked at ccs and i did quite a bit a few years ago and it seemed to me the challenge is more likely to be in finding places to put it and how far away those places are from where you create CO2 than the actual technology itself. I mean, we know how to separate CO2 from other stuff. We know how to stick CO2 back where it came from. Um, the trick is if where you're sticking it and where you're producing it a long way apart, then the cost become quite, the simple logistical cost of transporting CO2 um, is, is quite high. And of course, you've still got to be pretty comfortable that the geological structures are Fine, and I'm, you know how many of those? And Ross is like, you're right that probably that's where we haven't done as much uh, in terms of understanding the role of CCS in, in Australia or anywhere else in the world. To be fair, Anna, what's your thoughts about this? Sort of, as I said, there's a seems to be there's a there's sort of the land area has got a both, both a source of technology opportunity, but also a significant challenge in some parts of the agricultural um, emissions. But then this whole issue of some of those other key technologies. So in the in the last so your last five minutes, 
what's your thoughts about the, the, the sort of best and worst of the hydrogen, CCS and nuclear? And have you got any thoughts about from your work on the land sector as part of this deep decarbonisation challenge? Yes, uh, our work has looked at all of those. Uh, to cover it very quickly uh, and build on um, Ross and Guy, previous, the previous comments, which, which I certainly agree with. Um, <clears throat> in the last five years, when I was talking about that comparison that we did in our 2014 report, the electricity system scenarios included 100% renewables, it included about two thirds renewables and one third nuclear, as a base load and it included an alternative which was CCS as that third of the base load. We worked with CSIRO, repeated the exercise this time around, six years on, the, the, the same team updated technology cost assumptions and all the scenarios chose 100% renewables for Australia. So nuclear and, and CCS were, were out competed on cost for the reasons that Guy and Ross have spoken about. But the same research kept CCS in the mix for industry. For example, cement, other process emissions, uh, continuing uh, fugitive emissions from LNG or oil and gas, if that continues into the future. So um, CCS is still, at the moment, a necessary solution for industrial emissions that would otherwise escape, um, that are not able to be substituted by the energy mix change. It may be that there are breakthroughs in the future with microalgae or other alternative but at the moment, the way the scenarios that we worked on with CSIRO, the best available data is at the moment, none of those are promising enough to be able to, if you like, outcompete the viability of what CCS could uh, prov provide. So it's a valid um, technology necessary for the abatement of industry, mostly. Hydrogen has been the big game changer that's emerged in that six years. So when we last did the study, uh, hydrogen was not a viable alternative for steel making or transport. It was, it, was, it was in the mix in fuel cells at, at the edge. Even two years ago when we began the updating for this work, the hydrogen data wasn't advanced enough for us to run a full scenario on it. It's moving really fast. But the reason I call it a game changer is that, is that it does enable us to substitute the very fossil fuel intensive um, industry production of steel but also substitute LNG energy source with, with a cleaner gas that can be shipped. So we can solve shipping and portable energy uh, as well as steel making um, and a number of other uses uh, that help decarbonise fertiliser and ammonia production also. Uh, so it, it's a game changer for those abatement solutions, but it's also a game changer for Australia's national narrative and outlook and solves that other hard to address problem which is what do we do if we're not exporting coal and other fossil fuels that give us such a large contribution to our GDP? Completely valid question. And hydrogen can allow Australia to export at world scale an energy that is demanded already by Japanese and Korean buyers that are signalling that intent within a decade to want to buy clean gas. And therefore allow us to replace what is otherwise a really significant share of GDP with a new source of exports. So hydrogen is a real game changer for both of those reasons, the technological and the economic. Right. Yeah, I kind of, yeah that's right. Sorry, I keep going. Oh, you wanted me to ask on land. Um, I, I won't add any more time to Guy's summary. You were absolutely right to highlight those technological opportunities. What I wanted to bring in is that we're looking at land in a much more holistic approach here around systems change, if you like, or nature-based solutions. And it's a little bit like the circular economy approach to manufacturing. That actually when you when you move beyond cost curves for individual technologies and we think about what are the other changes that are occurring at the same time as decarbonisation, working within planetary boundaries broader than just carbon, we find that the, the same co-benefit story that we found with renewables, you get cleaner air, you get quiet transport, you, you get more efficient industry, you get all these other benefits while you're decarbonising. The same is true for land. When nature-based solutions and regenerative agriculture can work together, not just for sequestration, but we find that it improves the quality of the product. Wool is stronger, fruit is um, more attractive to the supermarkets through regenerative agriculture measures. Soil retains more water, which we're gonna need in a drought intensified future. And there are what, what are often dismissed in the climate world as co-benefits. Indeed, they are core benefits to regions in Australia and to agricultural producers. 
But right. the barrier that you asked for is the transition from where we are today to that future. And it's, I would say, just a case of investment, investment of, of capital and time uh, to do the regeneration, to bring in the new technologies, the new methods. And that, that is a product of time. And so, again, government and society can provide that support through consumers choosing the products, but also through, like we have with ARENA and the CFC, we've had support for the technologies. We can do that on land, but consider it in a more holistic approach, um, like circular economy, for a truly sustainable food system that would then allow us to live within the planetary boundaries and in balance uh, alongside the decarbonisation decarbonization right. goals. And I'm actually really optimistic about that. When you read about the benefits, it's so wonderful. Like to get this right, it absolutely is a triple bottom line win. So that I think justifies a case for substantial public and private investment. Right, okay. And Ross, in two minutes, um, nuclear or and the agricultural food sector. I'd just be interested if you want to choose one of those and give us your current thinking about that topic, whichever of those two you like. Yeah, well, I'll do briefly on both. That nuclear okay. is a fine zero emissions technology mm -hmm. in countries where you're confident there'll be political stability for the next couple of hundred years. Uh, don't forget, we tried to talk the, Zah, the, the uh, Shah of Iran into going nuclear so we could sell uranium in, when Jim Cairns was trade minister in 1974. That wouldn't be great today. Uh, um, uh, but where there's political stability like here and uh, uh, Germany and, and, and France and Japan, then uh, it's fine technology. Uh, uh, Anna's exactly right. It just doesn't stand up economically against renewables here. It does in some places. It does economically at this stage as part of the mix in India and China, and uh, and so it's part of the global solution. Uh, I think the landscape opportunities are immense. Uh, they do require the sort of investment in research, development, and commercialization that we gave to renewable energy, uh, but they are huge potential. Uh, the future of the zero emissions industrial economies in, and of Australia's comparative advantage globally in that is going to be built a, 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 on two things, uh, low cost uh, renewable energy based on excellent resources and a huge opportunity for low cost reduction of biomass on land that's not great for, uh, for pure agriculture. So uh, that, that's a, a, a huge opportunity. Ross, thank you very much. And um, I notice it's just ticked over one o'clock. So, um, look, that's been, a, for me, a fascinating conversation. And I think there's sort of, a, by the mixture of pessimism and optimism, I think, a broadly optimism, I'll have to say. Um, that's not a bad thing by any means. I'd like to think we all are optimistic about where we can go. But clearly, there are some challenges. Um, and ours is just as much, in Australia, just as much as anybody's. So, to summarise, I won't attempt to summarise that. Um, for those of you who've, um, who've listened to this webinar, you will get, um, if you've given us your email, you'll get a, uh, an opportunity to comment about what you thought about it. Um, I'd certainly like to thank you for joining us. I recognise the, the, um, the partnership with the State Library of Queensland. As I said, hopefully we'll have our forum publicly, although the number of people who registered for this uh, webinar, we wouldn't fit them in the State Library of Queensland, so maybe you're better off using webinars as an ongoing thing. Um, but Ross, I hope you stay well in Barcaldon. Anna, I hope you're not in a lockdown, lockdown suburb. And Guy um, is working with me, Grant, and I hope we get to be a bit more face to face in the near future. Um, and finally, look, thank you for the panel. Um, thanks to those from Grattan who helped organise this. And um, best wishes for whatever uh, the next day and the next several weeks or years ahead holds for all of us. Thank you very much. <laughs>